Good evening, everyone. Broadcasting live, March 29th. So, this is an interesting quote. It's fairly specific, but it's talking about anger. Tayo me bikui pungala santo sangwin jamana lokasmi. There are these three people existing, found to be existing in the world. What three? Bas basanale kupamo, one who is like a scratch on a rock. Pasana leka le kupama upamo pugalo pasana le kupamo person who is like a, a scrap carve carving in a rock leka means uh, it's actually where writing the word for writing came from it means a scratch. Second one, Pattavile Kupamo Pungalo, person who is like Upama means uh, a comparison, or it can be compared to a scratch in the earth, a line drawn in the earth. And the third one, Udakale Kupamo Pungalo, one who is like carving in the water, scratching, a scratch in the water, writing in the water. Maybe lake um, just means writing again, let's see here. No, something like, something like that. Yeah, it can be either an inscription or a write or writing. From leak, which is the root in regards to writing. So these three types of people. Someone one type of person is like a writing in a rock, one type of person is like writing in earth, one person type of person is like writing on water. And what sort of person is like writing in rock? Oh, someone is a binhang kunjati, is angry constantly, always getting angry. And when they're angry, when they get angry, they stay angry. Where the anger lasts for a long time, right? Yeah, the anger lasts for a long time. Just like a carving in the rock, it's not so soon worn away. And then another person is like, what is the person like writing on earth? They get angry often, but their anger doesn't last for a long time. So just like you can write on earth, you can leave a mark, but the mark fades away quickly. Not like rock. After a good rain, so this sort of person, you know, people get angry, 
this is a sort of your average person. Someone who gets angry and, and stays angry, well, that's a, they've got a problem. Person who's not able to let go of their anger, that's a big problem. People who get angry are just ordinary people. They can actually be good people. Good people can get angry. It's not, it's not a good thing, but they can otherwise be good. It's a question of how they deal with the anger. Do they take it out on others? Do they let it stew and try to find you know, ways to express their anger through unwholesome deeds? Or do they let go of it? Do they see the anger for what it is? And, and this goes with all of the defilements. It's important because when we meditate, these emotions are going to come up. We're training this is why we call it practice. It's not perfect. So when you practice, sometimes you fail. And quite often we fail in terms of seeing things clearly. As a result, we get angry or we want something, we greedy, attached to something. Or we're worried or we're uh, conceited or we're self-righteous. Any number of things come up. The question is, what we do then? You know, are we able to be mindful of those things? So the best is if you can catch the experience before the anger even comes up, or greed, or, or delusion. But once it does come up, it's still possible to uh, salvage the situation by letting go of it. You know, seeing, saying angry, angry, or wanting, wanting, or thinking, thinking, or so on. And then there's the third type of person, like the water. This this is it's totally different. This, you know, you can't write on water. It's kind of funny to think that why it's funny to think of writing on water is because you can't do it. The Buddha uses this sort of simile often. He talks about someone who tries to attack water, tries to uh, attack it or tries to uh, splash the water around and, and, get, and destroy the ocean kind of thing. We should be like water. Water is never, you can't write in water. You can't, uh, you can't affect the water substantially can't leave your mark. No matter what happens, no matter what happens to them, ide kacho pungalo agarhe napi uchamano. When they're spoken to roughly, paruse napi uchamano. When they're spoken to uh, unkindly, amana be napi uchamano. They're spoken to with words that are detestful, words that are not pleasant. But they stay sandhya, whatever that means, sandhya ting. Should mean when they're, uh, no, my poly's not good enough. etched a line etched in water remains on friendly terms mingles and greets him Sandia ting ewa, sang san da ting ewa, samoda ting ewa. Samoda ting means, samoda ting means 
it's agreeable, it's friendly. I don't think he's got these in the right order. Sandhya Ting means continues to stay with that person. Doesn't have any sort of, doesn't ho have any grudge when people are mean to them, when people do and say things. What this made me think of, uh, today I taught meditation throughout the day. Well, till about 3.30. And uh, two people, actually more than two, I got a bunch of skeptics. I think everyone's thinking too much because of exams coming up or something. But uh, one of them was really bad. He, uh, it's this, people take the easy way out of an argument. But it's called the eel wrigglers. In the Buddhist time, they called them like people who wriggle like an eel. Um, I think we, it's the kind of sort of what we call it today, the moral relativist, for example. Someone who, who refuses to take a stand and says there is no absolute, um, no absolute truth. And so whatever I said to this guy, he said, well, maybe to someone it's like this. I said, you know, so take, we're talking about fear. He said, well, fear can be useful. And I said, well, you know, I, I disagree. I think, you know, you don't need fear to do this or that. There's nothing that you need that you need fear for. But then I said, well, what about, let's talk about uh, uh, irrational fear. Like suppose you see a mouse and you get afraid of the mouse. And he said, well, the mouse could jump. He actually, I think, has some mental problems like... Um, he was laughing a bit maniacally and talking very quickly and um, or maybe he was on drugs, I don't know. <laughs> but but uh, he said, well, the, the mouse could jump up and bite you. But I mean, it was, it was a ridiculous conversation in the end. Um, in the end, I said something that I think is, is a good point that has to be made, but I'll, I'll mention that. But why I bring it up is this idea that um, well, actually, no, it does tie in with my point. I, finally, I, I, I pinned him down, I, and he tried to respond. I said, no, you stop. You don't talk. You let me talk. And I said, and I said, no, and he tried to talk. I said, no, let me finish. And I said, uh, if you're going to learn meditation, if you're going to sit here and, and we're going to progress, you have to agree. There's There are certain things we have to agree on. If you don't agree with me on these things, then I can't help you. And so we have to agree on is that there are certain things that we could do without, certain things that we would be better off without. And he said, well, you want to hear my take on that? I said, no. <laughs> and I said, you either agree with me or you don't. And he said, well, I don't agree with you. Well, I don't. And I said, okay. And he left, and that was that. Why this made me think of that is, you know, this is something, uh, this idea of, of getting angry. I mean, it shows a progression here of three types of people, and there's an obvious implication here is that anger is not a good thing. And we should strive to be like a person. I mean, I think the Buddha was sort of exceptional in, in just laying these out. This, and he often did this. He, he didn't so often say, you know, here's a person who is angry, and that's bad, don't be that person kind of thing. He, he didn't so often talk like that because he wanted to lay things out as in terms of reality you know, to say there are these three types of person but you know why would he, why is he teaching this if just to lay them out and say okay yeah all three of these are equal or and there's no let's not have any judgment about them the way he lays it out is is quite beautiful and anyone who looks at this the idea is that it resonates with you just by reading it you resonate and you you incline towards uh, the person who's like writing on water because we're familiar with these. And it, it, it is innately unpleasant to us. It, 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 it's discordant for someone to, to be often angry and moreover to hold on to anger long. Anger is inherently bad. This is the point. If you don't agree with that, and, and it's, you know, it's such an easy thing to just disagree and say, well, you know, 
maybe there's something good about it. Uh, this guy took it to the extreme where there's this idea that you see a mouse and maybe it would jump on you. And I'm like, really? Are we really going to go there? Uh, and I was just trying to point out that we can act irrationally and he wouldn't even accept that. Well, maybe it's rational to them and that kind of thing. I mean, it, this is really a, you know, a, a proper stance you can take, but it, it does... It does sort of exemplify the idea of things like moral relativism, where you know everything is relative. It doesn't really. There's nothing really good or bad. But I think that's a. There's some truth to it in the sense that everything is just things, but our minds don't work that way. Our minds do have an intrinsic compass. And so when you read this, you don't have to be told you'd better be the person without anger. You know, the Buddha lays it out just so beautifully that you can read it and get the impression. And you think, yeah, I don't want to be that person who is like a scratch on rock. I don't want to be the person who holds on to anger. I don't even want to be the person who gets angry. You, know, you think of this person who is, you know, when someone speaks harshly to them and then they're still friendly and kind to the person, wow, you know, that resonates. No, you don't have to say which one is better, we know. Unless we're, you know, this is the problem is we've gotten so messed up and now we have these, uh, we have these, the, this television shows, there's this one called, you know, everyone knows of it, I'm just hearing about it, called Game of Thrones. And apparently it's full of morally corrupt <laughs> characters. And this is the kind of thing. And then there was another one, my brother, I also, you know, I'm not watching this, called Breaking Bad. And it's apparently about a guy. I mean, all of you know about this. I'm sure all of you probably watch, watched it. It's about this guy who makes meth. Uh, and so apparently, you know, he's a good guy. And then he, over, my father explained it to me. Over seven seasons, he, 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 he breaks bad. He turns bad. And uh, I don't know, I mean, they were arguing, saying, you know, it's actually not glorifying this, but my point being, I mean, I think all of this is indicative of some kind of, you know, I, I, mean, I don't want to say lack of compass, because I think the compass is there. I think inherently in reality there is, there is ethics. You know, ethics, reality is not atoms. Reality is experience, and it has an inherent ethic to it. We don't want to suffer. We can try to convince ourselves that we do want to, just for the sake of convincing ourselves, but you're just twisting yourself, tying yourself in knots. Anger is bad. You can pretend that it's good, and you can start to believe that it's good, and you'll just fall flat on your face, tying yourself in knots, until finally you get tired and you come back to square one where anger is bad. So you, you right, you, so you say anger is good, and then you try it out, and it ends up messing everything up for you. At the very least, we can say there are desires in the mind, and uh, our desires conflict with with the the um, with their goals. They're inconsistent. So I want mm, I want to beat someone up because that will make me happy. You, know, you beat someone up and then you're not happy, right? I want to rob a bank so I can be rich and enjoy the money. You rob a bank, you won't enjoy the money, even if you get away with it. The world doesn't work that way. You end up just perverting your experience. And you become inconsistent. So you can say all you want, well, it's, you know, all things are equal, what does it matter? We don't think that way. You're full of desires and your desires are conflicting and your desires are, are inconsistent. And you do something because you want to be happy, but it makes you unhappy. So you can say, well, that's fine, but no, it's, it's really not. You're, you're not, because you're not impartial. You know, and, and your impartiality is, or your partiality is messing you up because you're partial to things that are hurting you, partial to things that aren't 
um, that aren't um, fulfilling your wishes. Anyway, I just thought it was an opportunity to talk about this ridiculous, because you you know it's it seems like a sound idea. Yeah, yeah. What, you know, why is there this moral absolutism or, or any kind of absolutism, absolute truth kind of thing? But you know. It, Finding all it is is I would say it's intellectual dishonesty to suddenly come out and say oh there is no truth Well, anyone can say that I mean how e how hard is it to say? I don't believe this. I don't believe that and so this is the Buddha himself attacked this idea you know, That 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 there's that you can't pin someone down. What do you believe? Oh, well, you know What's there to believe? I don't say this I don't say that and you know I don't say anything basically and when anyone tries to tries the hard work tries to do the hard the difficult thing and find an answer find the truth right i mean it's 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 like in this day and age trying to find the truth is seen as naive is seen as uh, brainwashed or fanatic you know the relig all the religions of the world claim to have truth you know obviously none of them do right so they have all these ridiculous claims about God and heaven and so on that are unsubstantiated. And as, as I mean, so that's kind of the backing as a result of all that. People have given up the search for the truth and they've come upon this, what seems like a better idea because it works, it resonates. But what, it resonates because it's just so easy. You don't have to believe anything. You know, eat, drink and be, <laughs> be merry. But it's easy. It's lazy, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Much harder to try and find the truth. Obvious, I mean, obviously, millions of orders of magnitude more difficult because everyone tries to find the truth and, and, and fails. And so now it's like we're just giving up, which is just laziness. So I mean, we make the same claim, we claim to have found the truth, and not only the truth, but the noble truth. So we don't worry about all truths, we just worry about the truths that are important. And so we have these four noble truths. And, uh, and that's basically what I was saying. If you don't agree that certain things are suffering, if you don't want to be free from suffering, if you don't understand this idea, and it doesn't resonate with you, then I've got nothing to say. It's fine. It, it, you know, you want to talk about everything's okay? Well, sure, it's okay, but I have nothing to say to you. I mean, I guess I would even say even further is that you're all messed up if you don't, if you don't understand this idea. But people don't, and then they say, well, what about wanting to be free from suffering? A lot of people are uh, antagonistic, not a lot of people, but I do get people who are kind of skeptic, I guess. Not antagonistic, just skeptic. Either because of their own religion, which conflicts with mine, or because they've given up a religion, and therefore they're skeptical about all religions. But that's why people don't like to call Buddhism religion, because they don't believe in religion. You know, I get this, So I get asked that a lot. Actually, one, one of the questions today was, Buddhism is Buddhism religion, basically. I didn't answer it. I was saying, you know, is it really useful to talk about it? Maybe I was a little bit mean to him, but he was very argumentative. This was the second guy who was an ex-Sikh, but he still wears the turban, so I thought he was a Sikh, and he said, oh, I just wear it for my parents. Um, I lost my train of thought. Enough. Anyway, that's about anger. It's been a long day. I taught meditation today and uh, just a five minute meditation. It's not too much. And then I went to <coughs> a lecture on perspectives on peace and like the future of peace studies at McMaster. They didn't actually, I was thinking they might. They might talk about um, peace studies in the future at McMaster, but they didn't really. 
I'm interested in peace studies. I mean, it's a broad, uh, it's a broad topic. Obviously, I'm more interested in inner peace, but that's a valid part of it. You know, a lot of it has to do with things like war and, and conflict. But what we're dealing with in this class are three, three documents, basically. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, uh, or executive summary, I think it's called, the Happiness Report, and the UN Resolution 70.1, or 70-1, depending on how you write it. So the TRC is uh, about the First Nations people. I talked about that before. Um, and it's interesting as a Buddhist, you know, how do we relate to this? Because, I mean, land claims and culture and self-governance and all these things are not really of interest. But there's so much more to the situation in Canada. I mean, we're living on a legacy of not only apartheid, but um, cultural genocide is what the TRC calls it. And that may not sound all that menacing, cultural genocide. Well, it's just culture, but it was really more than that. It was, I guess, genocide in general because they uh, we, like today she dr doubleday the the professor who gave the lecture or the um whatever you call it this is the talk she mentioned a person a man who had grown up in the residential schools and then tried to go back to his community in the north and uh, and and they didn't recognize him and nobody remembered him but he kind of remembered some of the people in the community but it didn't matter because they couldn't talk to each other. He didn't speak their language, let alone have any inkling of his own culture because he'd, been, he'd grown up being told that his culture was wrong. And so here's a person who has no, no place in the world, doesn't know who he is, and has grown up you know, abused, basically. It was, it was child abuse for the most part. I don't know. I mean, I suppose they, in some cases, they argue it wasn't, but there was sexual abuse, child abuse, and and it just is child abuse to take people away, to take kids away from their families and their culture. Anyway, so what we're dealing with in Canada is is, and what's most interesting to Buddhism is uh, a lot of issues of you know, mental health, suffering, and and uh, yeah suffering in many on many levels so that's interest it is interesting it's not not immediately something i would focus on but i'm interested in it especially in terms of um accepting and recognizing the suffering of these people and, and doing what we can to set it to, to move towards some kind of um, amelioration of their situation. I've got an exam on the, on Thursday on this, so it is highly on my mind. Day after tomorrow, an exam. Um, the second one is the happiness report, which was put together between, was commissioned or it was started by the king, I think, of Bhutan. Anyway, Bhutan was involved with this. But the happiness report is interesting. It talks about what leads to happiness. And they identify six factors. There is, the first one is economy. And, and economics is, uh, a country's wealth is actually a good indicator of happiness, apparently. Um, you know, which romantically we don't want to think of that. Money is not the cause of happiness, but you know, abject poverty and, and a country that has a low GDP per capita um, it's apparently, uh, I mean, abject poverty is, is causes a lot of suffering. It's hard to be happy and at peace when your basic needs aren't being met. Um, but another interesting part of that is this idea of equality. Because in Canada, there are a lot of happy people. And so Canada ranks fairly high on, on happiness in the world. 
But uh, one point our professor made is that, you know, not everyone is happy. You've got happy people, but then you've got the indigenous peoples of Canada suffering terribly. In Buddhism, that's interesting from the point of view of karma. So we don't think of peoples as peoples. We're all just people and we're all just beings. So we take turns. I, I probably haven't been... Uh, no, I haven't been white my whole life. I was probably Asian. That's why I got such a connection with Asia. But we, we, you know, we switch. And so the first one now will be later be last. We uh, we might be on top now, but if we crush those underneath us, guess where we're going in the next life. I mean, it makes sense. It's logical that it's probably happened like that. Not exactly. It's very complicated, but. There's that kind of trend. And so the idea of equality may be from a Buddhist point of view. I mean, like all issues, it, uh, it, it it's only going to happen when we start acting uh, with equality. We start basing our actions on helping other people, which I guess is the point, yeah. Anyway, so you've got GDP, and then you've got um, healthy life expectancy, social support, and trust. You know, if there's trust in a society, trust of the government, when the government is corrupt and so on, that has an effect on happiness. Uh, and then perceived freedom. And generosity, number six is generosity. I think it's number six because it's the least important, which is odd. I'm, I'm not really, probably have to do more studying to really understand these six, but I've been a bit busy. That, but, you know, the idea of a happiness report, the whole point of it is to look at uh, progress in the world and development in a different way, to not look at it in terms of... Um, simply money look at it in terms of happiness look at uh, it in you no know, put the people first instead of the the state you know is a state doing well is our state rich and so on it's not so important as are the people happy and so that's the, the the idea of the happiness report is to change the way we look uh, at progress and to focus more on happiness which is, you know, very Buddhist. It was Bhutan is a Buddhist country, so he's got the same sort of ideas as we do. The third one we're looking at is the UN Resolution 70-1, which is based on the Millennium Goals. It's, um, it's now these 2030 goals, that by the year 2030 we should uh, have ended poverty. And we should uh, have... Uh, ended, you know, climate change, ended our, we should have uh, solved, I mean, at this point it's probably too late to solve, but we should have done what we can by 2030 to get things back on track. Uh, and so our prof is raving about this. She's she's really an exceptional person who had done so much. Um, she's got, I was reading off, she's got like two, she's got a PhD and, and a Bachelor of Education and and a law degree and uh, she's been just about everything done a lot of work with the UN and stuff so I'm really keen to have the potential to work with her in the future it was a really good talk you know she really um, understands the issues and she's worked so much so it's neat to be able to work with her um, so anyway, this resolution is is in regards to sustainable development. Um, so trying to figure out what is required for the human race to to sustain itself, and you know that's not that interesting from a Buddhist perspective because you know it's short sighted. Eventually, the human race is going to go up in a ball of flames. But um, the, the 
factors that lead to um, lead to sustainable or contribute to sustainable development are interesting. I mean, we have these six principles, uh, six P's, five P's, five P's. Uh, people, planet, peace. You know, people, planet, prosperity, peace, and the planet and partnership. Sorry. So people, putting people first, and this is in regards to poverty. Uh, the planet, that's in regards to climate change. Prosperity is in regards to economics. Uh, number four is peace, and peace is important. Of course, we're in peace studies, so we talk about it especially. But there's a quote in the in the resolution, I think, that says, "Yeah, it's a sustainable development." Um, is not possible without peace. Depends on peace. And peace depends on sustainable development. So they, they and, and so they, they stress that quote, that they're, they're, they work together. And she said this was uh, pretty awesome because apparently it's the first time they've used this sort of language where they've really focused on the idea of peace. The language is new to the UN apparently something about how you know, normally they don't concern themselves so much about peace. So to include that was apparently significant. Um, and then the fifth one is partnership. Partnership is interesting, working with not just governments working together, but all peoples on all levels. I mean, you could include religion in there but NGOs and just individuals who have a stake in things grassroots organizations, that kind of thing. Yeah, so maybe that's not that. I mean, it's not all what I would want to focus on as a Buddhist, but, uh, you know, in general, talking about peace, I think it's quite useful. But as you can see, it's a little bit worldly. But it's worldly in terms of the big things, you know, what affects people, how, how people find happiness. And so talking about these things is interesting. Learning about these things is somehow useful. As I said, I'm obviously more focused on the, the uh, mental health and inner peace, of course. But that's what I'm studying. And then I've got my Lotus Sutra essay, which is almost done. I've just got to write the conclusion. And that's due tomorrow, but there's an extension, so we have to work on it till Friday. Anyway, so I've opened the hang up out, hang out up. Nobody joined, so I'm assuming there are no questions. I think we'll stop it there. And I may, we'll have to see how the next days go. Probably tomorrow I'm just not going to broadcast in preparation for my exam. Um, okay. So I guess that's all for tonight. Have a good night.